James 1.14, I'll read it over us and then we'll pray. Uh, if you got a copy of your scriptures, James 1.14, if you don't, just listen. It says this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, thank you for a few minutes around your word. I pray you'd help us understand it, God. Help us see what it is you care about. And then, Lord, I pray you would help us care about what you care about. So I'm asking you to open our, our minds and then I'm asking you to shift our hearts tonight because I want our lives to be different. I want us to be different as a result of this night. And I can't produce that, but you can. And I just want to invite all of you, whether this is your normal thing or you have never done it, if you're willing, you just take a moment and you talk to God and ask him, say, Lord, please teach me tonight. Uh, and then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I would be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several years ago, I had the opportunity to train a Navy SEAL, attend a Navy SEAL training exercise. And I watched a SEAL team take down a house filled with enemy combatants who were holding hostages. Uh, and it was a training evolution. Uh, so they were using simunition rounds, paintballs, uh, but they're fired out of real guns. So they go fast and hard and hurt. Now, it was my understanding that I would be watching this from the safety of an observation deck. However, when I showed up, I was standing with the commanding officer and as we watched the team approach the door of the building, he motioned with me to start walking towards the door. And then at one point he stopped me and he goes, hey man, I wouldn't get any closer than this if I were you. He said, when they blow that door, sometimes the handle can shoot off like a bullet. I would stay right here. And I was like, yeah, the guy hadn't planned on being this close. And sure enough, they blew open the door and they went charging in. And then he hit me in the chest and said, let's go. And he went running into that doorway and I followed him in jeans and a t-shirt. And as I passed through that door, two things struck me immediately. Metaphorically speaking. The first one was the chaos of the situation. It was bedlam. There was smoke everywhere, shots fired, flashbangs. It was crazy. But the second thing that struck me was the beauty of the SEALs' strategy. They were aggressive, but they were graceful. They were purposeful, but they were patient. They would come to an open doorway, and with barely a nod, two of them would swing out and cover one another so they could eliminate all threats without ever being an open target themselves. And within seconds, these guys had eliminated all enemies, rescued all hostages, and taken a chaotic situation and brought peace. And I remember looking at that and thinking, now that's the Christian life. Or it's supposed to be. Like, I don't know about you, if you know Jesus or walk with him, or even if you're here just investigating spirituality, you don't have to attempt intimacy with God very long before you realize the pursuit of intimacy with God is done in the context of adversity. It's a fight. Some of you maybe felt it your New Year's resolution. You're like, I'm going to read the scriptures every day. And the minute you opened it up, all kinds of rival thoughts and competing affections come. And you're like, why can't I do something simple like focus? Or others of you had New Year's resolutions and you're like, I'm going to change the world. And those have already all been broken. And you go, I don't understand it. The good I want to do, I'm not doing. And the evil I wanted to stop, I keep doing that. And you go, there's something wrong with me. And there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong here. And I'll be honest with you, as particularly as I look at our world today, we're all feeling that. We're feeling there's all manner of anxiety in the culture and animosity, polarization online that's uh, giving rise to depression, discouragement, anger. Your generation is facing challenges that are unique and heavy. And if you look at it, you go, man, I don't feel like we're flourishing. It feels like we're struggling. And there's political solutions to some of this. And there's physical solutions to some of this. But even if we had perfect laws and you ate all your vegetables, there's still something wrong with you and wrong with all of us. 
And you go, it feels spiritual. It feels deep for us. And that's true. That spirituality works itself out in the context of adversity. And I think some of us, we feel that and you go, man, I just thought it would be easier. And you're discouraged by the situation. I think if we're honest, some of us in here feel that. You go, I just thought if I took God seriously or came to Jesus, it would be easier. I just thought some of the desires I had would go away. Some of the addictions would cease. I don't know. I just thought I'd be happier, more joyful, just fly around, sprinkle Jesus dust on everyone. Like, I don't know. I just thought it would be easier than this. And you're discouraged by the situation. And then in moments like this, we parade people on stage to give their testimonies. They're like, I just want you to know I was addicted to every drug in mankind. And I gave my life to Christ and have never felt tempted once since. And you're like, that's amazing. He's like, God just uprooted it all. And you're like, he didn't even mildly prune my addictions. There's worse as ever. And for some of you, if I can just be real, you, you don't sing in moments like this with great passion because that constant static of guilt and shame is just running in the background of your story, muting out a passion for God. And the wet blanket of consistent failure is smothering your affections for the Lord. And some of you are just discouraged by the situation. It's the struggle. But I think others of us are like, no, Ben, I, I know that. I'm a Christian. I know the Christian life's hard. I've read the Bible and I've heard all the war imagery, fighting imagery. I know it's a struggle. I get that. I'm not discouraged by the situation. I just need a strategy. I want to look more like the seals and less like you. I want to look equipped in eliminating hostility. I don't want to be running around in flip-flops going, it's smoky in here. And some of you go, and the strategies you've employed are not working. Like, I don't know about you. I went to summer camp every summer. And in my summer camp, the first few days, everyone lived crazy. We were all smoking, drinking 40s. That's a true story, by the way. But on Thursday night, man, everybody got saved. <laughs> After a couple nights of staying up late, we were all in an emotionally volatile state. Malnutritious food. Pitched in as well. And then in that moment, the band would get us all fired up. And then the speaker would come and get us all emotionally riled up. And then at the end of the night, we'd have locked pinkies and swaying, singing friends are friends forever. And right at the emotional pitch, it was open mic night. And one after another, we would get on stage and say all, all the promises of what we were going to do for God. I just want you all to know, I'm never going to sin again. You're like, I don't think he is. He's had such a good week at camp. I think it's done. <laughs> I just want you all to know, I'm going to tell everyone on the planet about Christ. He's prophesying right now. It's amazing. And on and on it would go. But there wasn't a one of us that two weeks later hadn't broken every promise. And we were surrounded by the same addictions going, what's wrong with me? Maybe spirituality is for some other crew of people, but not me. And some of us go, man, I'm discouraged by this situation. And so here's what I want to do in our time tonight. I don't want to give you a pump up speech or tell you how to try harder. I almost want to, in an unemotional way, say, hey, if life is a struggle, how do we struggle well? So let's look at our situation, and then let's talk about a strategy. And the situation is, it feels like a war because it is. The pursuit of intimacy with God does occur in the context of adversity. We are in a fight. And as much as the Bible presents Jesus as a lamb and a shepherd, he is called a warrior. 1 John 3, 8 says, the son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That Jesus' arrival on the planet was a landed invasion. In Genesis, it said the seed of the woman has come to crush the head of the serpent. His first introduction is one of conflict. It will be difficult. And Jesus came as an invasion and a rescue operation. His first sermon, he said, I'm here to bring... Uh, proclaim release to the captives. One of my favorite explanations of his ministry, Jesus said, picture a strong man armored up and his possessions are undisturbed. He said, now picture someone stronger beating him up and stealing his things. That's me. You ever explain Jesus that way? He did in Luke 11. Why do you think demons screamed every time he walked into the room? Because the stronger one was here. I'm here to break the power of sin and set captives free. And can I just encourage some of you, some of you right now, you have addictions in your life and temptations in your life that own you in the dark. And even as I'm talking, the voice in your head is saying, you won't be free. I have good news for you. The stronger one is here. And he came to fight for you. 
and he came to fight for me, not by perpetrating violence, but by taking it upon himself. Since the children participate in flesh and blood, he likewise partook of the same, so that through his death he might set free those who through the power of death were held captive all their lives. That he came to set captives free, that he broke the power of sin. The devil's greatest weapon against you was the legitimate condemnation for your sin. And so he who knew no sin became sin for you. He took it on himself. He took your shame. He buried it in the grave and he rose victorious. And Colossians says that he is transferring us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. He's saying, I'm taking you out of the dark, bringing you into the light. You have switched kingdoms. He has fought for you. It's a rescue operation and it's an ongoing mission. It's not over. C.S. Lewis said, enemy occupied territory. That is what the world is. He said, but Christianity is the story of the true king has come. You might say come in disguise. And he is inviting all of us to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. We are in a war, but it's one in which our king has won the decisive victory. And because he's been victorious, we can too. And yet it's interesting. I'll talk to some people when they come to Christ. They're like, man, I just, I just thought if I put my faith in Jesus, I wouldn't struggle with these desires anymore. And I'm here to tell you, you need to read the scriptures. The the scriptures tell you Jesus didn't free you from the fight. He freed you for the fight. I mean, you look in the Old Testament at David. What happened when the Philistines attacked the Israelites? They came into their land. The Israelites cowered in fear until David stepped forward and beat the one they were afraid of, Goliath. And what did the Israelites do when they saw Goliath go down? They shouted the war cry and drove the Philistines out out of their land. It's the same with you and me. When we see that Jesus Christ, the son of David, fought for us, that he beat death for us, that shame is not the end of your story, the sins of your parents is not the end of your story, that you are not bound and captive anymore. When you understand that, you see your king fight for you. The best fighters are the ones who knew they were fought for. When you see King Jesus fight for you, that gives you the power to shout the war cry and drive the fear and lust and shame out of your own life. We've been set free for the fight, not from it. It's like master and commander. I don't know if you ever saw that movie starring Russell Crowe. He was charged with his ship of taking out Napoleon's great frigate. And at the end of the movie, he brings his ship alongside, disables the main mast, boards the ship, fights his way down into the hull. There in the bottom of the ship, all these English sailors are held captive. And so in the climactic moment, he breaks the chains, opens the cages, sets them free. Huzzah! But as they step out, they're each handed a sword because the fight's not over. And the Bible presents you and I the same way, that when you put your faith in Christ, he breaks chains, sets you free, and then hands you a sword. It says, before you were just a victim, now you have a chance to be a victor. I didn't free you from the fight, I freed you for it. Now you need to learn how to struggle well. So if I was to summarize spirituality, for those who put their faith in Jesus, I would say it's one movement with two parts. It's one movement with two parts. It's a movement away and a movement towards. It's a movement away from ways of thinking and ways of living that isolate us from the intimacy with God that Christ purchased. And it's a movement towards ways of thinking and ways of living that promote the intimacy with God that you and I were made for, right? Away and towards. Old school theologians had a word for this movement. They called it sanctification. Sanctification is built off the word holy and the word holy means set apart. And you hear those two parts in it. Like in the Old Testament, when they worshiped in the temple, there were utensils that were considered holy. They weren't used for common use. They were only used in the worship of God. They were set apart from something and set apart for something. Uh, My wife is the same way. She is holy unto me. No other man may touch her, right? Some of you have a coffee mug that way. It is yours alone. No other pagan dirty lips may touch it, right? And they had words, old school theologians, for each of these two parts. They called this part mortification. There are things that were a part of my life I must now mortify. I must now kill. They don't belong in my life anymore. And then there are other things that I need to vivify, help cultivate, bring to life, see flourish. Uh, If we were to use gardening imagery, this would be the pulling up of weeds. There's ways of thinking, ways of living you used to do before Jesus touched your life. Some of your friends still do, and they just don't belong in the soil of your soul anymore. And there are other things that God wants to plant in you, new desires, new pursuits, new ways of living that he wants you to cultivate and see flourish in the soil of your life, right? 
away and towards. You could call it the big no and the big yes. Christianity has a no. And some people think that's all Christianity is, just one big no, but it's not. It's no to all kinds of things to free you up for a better yes, right? Um, Paul told Timothy it this way. He said, flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call out to the Lord out of a pure heart. I flee and I pursue. Now, before we move off this, let me clarify. What I'm not saying is, so this is the devil side of the stage, and that's the God side of the stage. So you got to get on that God side, kids. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Because that makes it sound like God is over here waiting for you to get your crap together. And that's not how it works. When you put your faith in Jesus, he said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. And yet I know my wife's never going to leave me, but I can feel miles away from her because I haven't done the work to cultivate the intimacy that's available in our covenant. It's the same with you. The fight is for an unrestrained intimacy, right? Now, as soon as I say that, let me clarify this pursuit of ours that you're meant to do in college, to flee and to pursue, to uproot and to plant. This movement is not done in a vacuum. We have an enemy who hates our king, and so he hates you. So I remember my first day in middle school. It was very exciting. Uh, I was going to ride the bus with my older brother, who by every measure was endlessly cool. And so I remember as he got on the bus, he started to walk towards the back because that's where the cool kids sat. I, as his relative, made my way to the back as well because I was cool by proxy. And yet as I made my way, some kid jumped up in front of me and put his face right in my face. And this was before I understood that this is what some guys do when they want to fight. I just thought he had proximity issues. I'm like, man, why are our noses touching? And Mary said, are you Cole Stewart's brother? I said, yeah. He said, I hate your brother. I was like, okay. <laughs> when I found out later is this kid was a bully. Got some emotional need met by picking on little kids. There's one problem. He had also decided to play football. And my brother played football. And one day at practice, my brother was running with the ball. And this kid, Marvin, attempted to tackle him. And my brother hit him so hard that Marvin flew through the air and made like squealing sounds like a piglet. <laughs> Which when you're a bully, kind of cramps your style. So zoom back onto the bus, he looks at me and he says, I hate your brother. And then he says, so I hate you. And then he put his finger on my face and said, you look good with a cigarette burn here. Push my face. And then from behind him, we heard my brother's voice boom, Marvin. He kind of straightened up. And when he sat down, he said, it's going to be a long year, little brother. Now question, why do he hate me? I hadn't done anything to him. I'll tell you why because I look like the one who shamed him. And when Jesus Christ went to war for you, it said he made a public spectacle of the enemy when he triumphed over him. He humiliated him when he rescued you. You look like the one who shamed him. So when you come to Christ, you're not free from temptation. You might just be a bigger target because you look like the one who shamed him. So we need to look at what our enemy's doing and then we'll analyze what we do. So let's talk about strategy. If we have an enemy, what's his work? Well, his work is to get you to sin. What does that mean? That you would take a willful step away from the intimacy with God you were made for, using your gifts for his glory and our good. Why would you take that suicidal step away? Well, he has to convince you of something. He has to make that look attractive. And so he's going to solicit thoughts to your mind to stir your affections. And when you enact the will, you move the direction he wants you to go away from the author of life in a vain pursuit of life. Because he knows you. Namely, what he knows is your wiring, that you have a mind, cognitive processes. He knows you have affections, inclinations towards and disinclination towards certain things. And he knows you have a will, a decision-making mechanism. And he understands how that works, that what you think about is what you care about, and what you care about, you will chase. And so he'll solicit thoughts to the mind to stir the affections, right? And that environment where thoughts are solicited to your mind to stir your affections, the Bible has a word for it. It's called temptation. Temptation. And some of you say, well, Ben, where are you getting this? Well, we read it earlier, James 1.14. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured is the mind's attention. Enticed is the heart's affections, right? When you are lured and enticed by your own desire. And when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, it brings forth death. It leads you to places you were never meant to be. 
So I've used this example often. Ladies, uh, let's say you're getting ready for school in the morning and the thought solicited your mind, I am single. And as you consider that thought, you go, that's accurate. I'm neither married nor currently dating anyone. And then an Adele song comes on or Taylor Swift. And as those thoughts consult your affections, you go, but I don't want to be alone. I want to be with someone. And then you head to class and you see couples walking hand in hand and you see the animals going two by two and you're like, <laughs> everyone has someone but me. And as you're in that state, a thought will be propositioned and you'll date a loser. <laughs> he's beneath you morally. You know he's not interested in the purposes of your king. But you've been caught up in a mentality that you think this is the best you can do. And a whole cascading world of tragedies wait you on the other side. But how did it happen? What you think about is what you care about. And what you care about, you will chase. What do you entertain in your mind, young people? It will determine what you love and what you become. Or guys, you'll be getting ready for bed and the thought will be solicited in your mind, you should look at naked people on a screen. And as it consults your affections, you go, naked people, okay, off you go. That's about it for you. <laughs> Each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. It's coming for all of us. Some of the best self-knowledge you can have is how he gets you. It's coming for us. It's even called a lure. What do you do with a lure? You're trying to get the fish's attention, but you just don't want his attention. You want to stir his affections. So you want to give him something that would look attractive. Maybe it looks like a frog, and, and so maybe you swim it along so it looks wounded and delicious. And what's your hope? You want his attention, but you want his affections. You want to break him off mid-sentence with his other fish buddies. Like, anyway, so I was saying to him, well, hey, hey there, little buddy, right? <laughs> and then when he enacts the will, you got him. And he never saw the hook. And he never even understood there was a sentient mind behind all this. And yet some may look at that and go, a frog? Really? Ew. Like that turns you on? That's disgusting. Like, I don't know how you can call yourself a real fish and be into that. That's fine. He just gets a different lure for you. You go, ooh, shiny. And off you go. <laughs> Each one is tempted. Some of the best self-knowledge you can have is how does he tempt me, right? Sun Tzu said in the famous Art of War, he said, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. But if you know neither your enemy nor yourself, you will succumb to every battle. Right? So now that we know what he does, in our remaining time, let's talk about what we do. If that's the situation, what's our strategy? Let me give you three things. Number one, we could get from James, but let me read from his brother Jesus. It'll go faster. Matthew 26, 41. Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Notice what he says there. Jesus doesn't say watch and pray that you don't enter into sin. I mean, that's bad. But Jesus says watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. He says if this moment always leads to that moment, eliminate the moment. That's step one. Eliminate it. If I know this, the solicitation of thoughts to the mind, is stirring the affections, leads me to an act of the will to be a place I'm never meant to be that doesn't produce life, then let me fight the battle here. So I remember talking with a buddy years ago that had a friend confide in him that he and his wife had been arguing a lot and had become shouting matches and had really devolved. And, and my buddy was telling him, hey, you can't treat your wife harshly anymore. But then he asked him, analyze the situation. Don't let shame stop you from strategizing. What's going on? Where does it happen? And this guy said, well, we go out every Thursday to this bar and we drink and she never wears as many clothes as I want her to wear. And uh, guys hit on her, and she doesn't rebuff their advances, and, and I get mad, and then she gets mad that I'm mad, and we start to fight, and then when we get home, it escalates and escalates and escalates. And he told him, hey, man, like, there's probably some deeper work that needs to be done in counseling. You need the church to get around you. But maybe for a first step is if going to that bar, that crowd always leads to these outcomes, just eliminate that moment. Just don't go to that bar anymore. And he said it was like to never cross the guy's mind. He was like, but it's tequila Thursday. 
It's not worth sinning over. Or I'll talk to guys that struggle with pornography and I say, where does it get you? And they'll say, on my screens, in my bed late at night. Like that makes total sense. You're at your weakest moment. You put the world wide web by your head. That's like an alcoholic pouring scotch every night and going, all right, now I'm not gonna drink you. Like that's a bad strategy. Get the screens out of there. Make war on it. It's fascinating. I've actually never told the story, but when I lived here in College Station, uh, I used to work out, I had this big jungle gym rig in my backyard, all this kind of pull-ups and climbing ropes and all this kind of stuff that someone had put in my yard. And so a lot of college guys would come work out with me in the morning. And I remember I was waiting for them once and working out in the morning and I did a pull-up and as I did it, this big apparatus, as you pulled up, you could see into every yard in my neighborhood. And I did a pull up and looked and there in my neighbor's yard was my neighbor, a lady with absolutely no clothing on. And I was like, whoops, and dropped back down. I was like, oh man, like this is my oasis. This is where I go to get away from crazy. I don't need crazy in this space. And then all the college guys came over and they're like, all right, man, let's get this done. I was like, we can't work out today. Why? And I was like, cause there's a naked lady parading around over there. And it might be good. Y'all about all PR and pull-ups. You'll be like, hey, like, whoa. Like, but hey, that's not what we're here to do. So I said, we can't work out. And they're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do, man. Like, I really don't know what we're going to do. And we sat there and talked about it. Like, how are we going to handle this situation? And I'll tell you what we did. We went to Home Depot and we bought a bunch of lumber. And the next day, I, one of the guys, I didn't even call him. He had a post hole digger and he was digging a hole out in my yard. And we built a wall. We called it the hedge of protection. I'm not making this up. We built this 15 foot wall and people would come over and they'd be like, oh man, is that like a climbing wall? Where are the handholds? I'm like, nope, we don't climb that wall. Nope, we're not going above it. And they're like, well, what's it there for? And I'm like, ah, you know, it's kind of just like a hedge of, uh, I don't know, protecting us from such. Like I didn't want to out the lady and I uh, hope I didn't now. But anyway, I just thought you'd find that interesting because it's not worth sinning over. And some of us talk about our struggle against sin and you're not really struggling against sin. You're like, no, stop. And you're like, not really fighting that hard. I'm anxious all the time and depressed all the time. Well, what do you do when you wake up? I look at my phone and just kind of drink in the crazy. And then I wonder why I feel crazy. I'm like, well, if you don't like the outcomes, look at the inputs and eliminate the moment for your own sanity and for our good. We eliminate the moment. And number two is you paddle downstream and you look where it leads. Before I engage in a behavior, let me see where it'll take me. Before I jump into the boat, let me turn my ear downstream and hear the distant waterfall. And if I don't wanna end up there, let me cut it off here. James won't use paddling imagery. He says, then desire when it's conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. He actually doesn't even use fishing imagery. He uses birthing imagery. Because in Greek, the words can be masculine and feminine, like in Spanish. And desire, there's a feminine word. He says, when desire whispers to you, it's not, it's not a sin, but when you unite your will with desire, she gets pregnant. And she has a baby called sin. And some of you go, well, yeah, I know that happens and I don't care. But sin is also a feminine word. And it says sin, when she's fully grown, she brings forth death. And it's a shocking image that James plays with there because giving birth is literally the arrival of life. And James says, you give birth to death. It's a disturbing image if you really let your mind go there. And James does that to shock you, to break the spell. Because when temptation comes, it looks attractive. It doesn't come to you and go, you know what? We should just start an opioid addiction today. Let's give it a shot. It doesn't start there. It starts by picking at your resentments and then pulling you towards enticements. It starts by pushing you with frustrations and then opening an oasis. And it looks good and it disguises the fact that there's death on the other side. And you have to develop the discipline to go, no, before I jump in the back seat with that desire, what are we gonna produce and do I want that to be true in my life? When I lived here in College Station, I got a catastrophic back injury and it, uh, it was unclear if I would be able to walk again. And I remember in that moment wondering, what am I going to do? And there was only so much I could, but they're like, well, what you need to do is get in shape and you need to like lose 40 pounds and all this stuff that I was like, that sounds terrible. But the reality was we were pregnant with our first baby. And if you want to hold that child, you need to make life choices. But there was a problem. I love chocolate cake a lot. And I told my wife, if you keep buying these snacks, you'll kill, this will be your fault. Like it's, it's, it's really on you. 
And yet there were still moments when we got the snacks out, I would encounter chocolate cake. What am I gonna do? There was a voice in me that was like, I'm gonna eat that is what I'm gonna do. And what I started to do, I'm not making this up. I would look at it and be like, I could eat that. Like I have freedom, I can make my own choices. I could live that lifestyle and I'll stay where I am and be where I was and then I'll have to hire someone to play with my kids because I won't be able to. So what do I want more? Do I wanna hold my children or do I wanna eat whatever? And as I thought about it that way, the cake no longer looked alluring, it looked like an enemy. How dare you, sir? How dare you try to keep me from my children? Get out of here, cake! Because I could look downstream and see where it leads. And for some of us, we just need to have, develop that discipline. Before you engage in a behavior, you're gonna go out Thursday night? Where, where do you think that's gonna go? It's what alcoholics call thinking through the drink. You take one sip, where, where's the next one? Where are you leading? You going back to the room with him? Where's this going? And is that a place you wanna be? So we look downstream. And then the last thing James tells us to do is we look upstream. If temptation has destruction downstream, what's giving it the energy that's making it alluring? And he says, you look upstream and he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the father of lights in whom there's no shadow or shifting due to change. He says, if destruction is downstream from temptation, deception is upstream. But notice he doesn't say deception like these things you want to do are really bad for you. He says, don't be deceived. And what's the deception? He says, don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes down from your father. He says, the lie that launches a million sins is that God's not a good dad who will take care of you. That if you don't think God will meet your needs, if you don't think he cares about your love life, if you don't think he cares about your usage of your gifts, if you don't think he cares about looking out for you when you're struggling, if you don't think he cares, you'll go to a million other places to try to find happiness. So if the devil can sever you from the love of God, you will go to drink from many deceptive streams. And so James says, you fight the battle back here. Uh, I'll be honest with y'all. I used to hate the song, How He Loves Us. I don't know if I can say that here. Is this a safe place to say that? I didn't like the song. And, and I started to question it. Like, why do I not like the song? Is it the Doppler effect way we sing it? How we love us. Oh, how. Like, no, it's not that. Like, is it the lyrics? Like, yeah, I'm not a tree. And then I thought, no, there's nothing wrong with the lyrics either. I'm like, then what's my issue with the song? And then I realized my issue was I didn't believe it. That, that theologically I did. Yes, I know that God loves me. And yet, when they make you sing it over and over again, oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. As someone from a broken home, it, it sounded like it was mocking me. And then I had a kid. And I remember I would hold her at like the 2, 3 a.m. shift and uh, holding this little baby. And I'll never forget holding her and then feeling like this pain in my chest, like it was caving in. I was like, oh my God, like am I having a heart attack? What is this? And I was like, this, it's, it's love for you. And then I instantly felt the limits of language. I was like, I don't know how to describe this. Like there's no poem that I'm like, yeah, that sums it up. Like there's no poem, there's no song. Like even to say I would die for you is like, yeah, of course. Like that doesn't grab it. And then I was marveling and I'm like, and you've done nothing to deserve it. You don't pitch in around the house. You don't compliment a sermon. You're nothing but noise and need. But there's this exploding happening inside of me of like, I would do everything for this sweet girl. And I just remember thinking like, I just wish there was some way to encapsulate it in words, but I can't do it and you wouldn't understand it anyway. You're a baby, you don't speak English yet. And I was like, I don't know how to say this. And I felt like the Holy Spirit just got in there and was like, hey, do you think you have a greater capacity to love than me? You think you know how to love your kids more than God knows how to love his children? He purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I realized, hey, look, victimhood is real convenient. If you can convince yourself that God's victimizing you, that gives you license to do all kinds of broken and terrible things. But in that moment, I realized I had to repent of an unbiblically low view of the love of God. And let me tell you something, if you can understand that, that at the end of the day, a best defense is a good offense. If you can fight that lie, so many sins in your life will lose their power. Let me say it this way. If you decided to hate me, 
Let's say that was one of your goals for 2022. Destroy Ben Stewart. Let, let, me, let me tell you how to do it. You go to one of my little girls, and you cup their little face, and you tell them, man, you are such a disappointment to your dad. I mean, yeah, he loves you because he's such a great guy, but you are just such a hassle, and it's exhausting. You just keep screwing up, and you keep screwing up, and it's just, I just don't, I, no one really loves having you around. So the truth is, it would be real convenient if you would just go elsewhere. Find love somewhere else. Find acceptance somewhere else. Go get it in the arms of some other guy. Just get out of his presence. You do something like that, and you unleash rage inside of me. But I need you to understand that's how evil the enemy is. The lie that he brings from the very beginning in the garden is Eve, it looks like God's holding out on you. It looks like he's keeping you from really enjoying life, Eve. It looks like he, your religious commitments are keeping you from life enhancing experiences. It looks like your God doesn't care. It looks like what you care about doesn't matter to him. It looks like you don't matter to him. And he pushes on your sonship because if he can sever your vital union with God, he can get you to go to millions of different broken places. And so at the end of the day, the best defense against your sin is a good offense. I will flee by pursuing. I will run in the path of his commands because he set my heart free. How did Romeo get rid of Rosalind? How did Romeo get rid of Rosalind? Does anyone remember Rosalind? Romeo and Juliet, we don't read that here. It's an engineering school. Romeo and Juliet, read it at the beginning, what's happening? Romeo is pining away about Rosalind, about how beautiful she is and matchless she is and wonderful she is. And finally, he starts annoying Benvolio. Benvolio's like, dude, I'm taking you to a party tonight. There's like 100 girls there hotter than Rosalind. I promise you, read it. It's there. I'm giving you like the message version, but it's in there. <laughs> and Romeo says, the all-seeing sun has ne'er met her match since first the world began. There's no one hotter than Rosalind. And then he went to the party and he saw Juliet. And that night he snuck into her yard and said, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, which is already sick and pale with grief that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Rosalind who? <laughs> and the Puritans used to say it. How do you dislodge a beautiful thing from the human heart? You replace it with a more beautiful thing. And some of you, if I could encourage you this semester, it would be I dare you to go on a journey to really know your God. To put the screens down and pick your scripture up and dive deep into what your father is like. Because to see him is to love him. And to love him is to be more like him. Because when you set your mind on him, your affections are stirred for him. And when your affections are stirred for him, you will chase him. And you look out for what God will do in your life. I have watched so many students from this room not become less of who they were, but more who they were because of the freeing power of the inexhaustible love of God. Augustine was arguably the greatest mind in Christian history, second only to the Apostle Paul. Augustine encountered the claims of Jesus Christ and realized this guy has to be true. But he resisted putting his faith in Jesus because he knew it would cost him his pursuit of fame and his addiction to sex. Those were his comforts and his cause and he was scared to lose them. But he knew Jesus was true and so he wrestled deeply in the garden. Like some of you, I'm praying, will wrestle this semester. Do I believe Jesus is who he says he is or not? Do I want to follow him or not? Did he die for me or not? Did that death do something? Then what are the implications for me? Am I going to chase him or am I going to run down many deceptive paths? What am I going to do? And finally in that garden, he realized Jesus is who he says he is. History broke at the story of this man. I'm putting my faith in him, but it scared him to death to let go of these things. But then he wrote in his confessions, how sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys I once so feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are the true sovereign joy. 
You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. I came to A&M as a student with a lot of broken and sad things in my story, a lot of broken and had that sad ways of thinking and living. But every semester I would ask God, where do you want me to steal away with you? And I'd find little places in the library, on the football field, places I would steal away and pour out my heart to him. Sometimes with tears, sometimes with clenched teeth, sometimes beating on his chest, sometimes no resolution at the end. You seem mean there, amen, and then leave. But I kept pressing into him. And the more I pressed into him, the more I found he melted away some hurt He took some broken things in me I thought would always broke and he healed them. He took some bent things in me I thought would always be bent and he straightened them. And it was at breakaway, it was at my church, it was through some friends that I watched myself fall in love with Jesus in this school. And I found that the more I loved him, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I want that for you. That's where your freedom is to run in the path of his commands because he sets hearts free.